Podcasting is a word that is a portmanteau of iPod and broadcast. Though strangely, the word was in use even before the iPod officially added podcasting functionality to the device. Podcasting actually emerged as the consequence of version 0.92 of the Resource Description Framework Site Summary Standard, which was later truncated to Rich Site Summary, but which today is very often called Really Simple Syndication, RSS. And RSS is a standard that essentially allows you to code a page, a website, or a collection of information that makes it more easy to distribute, essentially. And so if you look at the code of a piece of RSS, it is a structural language that says this part of what I am writing is the title, this part of what I am writing is the description, this part of what I am writing is a file that I want delivered. And there are a lot of uses for this. RSS has been very commonly used to allow people to essentially subscribe to a blog, for example, because then when a new post is published on that blog, through your RSS feed, you can get an update that delivers you the title, the link to the full content, the description, and so on. But with version 0.92 of the RSS standard, suddenly audio files were added to the mix, and there was now a means of essentially putting an audio file out into the internet ether onto a server and allowing people to, one, be notified of it, two, see the data that is affiliated with it, the title and description and such, and three, to use a piece of software that would take that RSS file, that information that is contained within that, that structural page, and use that as a means of setting up a kind of distribution system using these apps, these applications, and this software that allow you to see and to parse, to, to read and understand this information that is disseminated through RSS with an audio file. These are called pod catchers. And the added benefit of using something like this above and beyond a standard RSS feed is that it also then allows you to download that file automatically, or automagically, it can seem sometimes, and then make those files available to you in a really easy-to-use library. And so this ends up looking like traditional broadcast, but it differs from webcasting and the streaming of audio files, because these files are additionally available offline. This is just a system that allows you to regularly ping these servers to see if there's something new available in a particular folder that contains these audio files and then these information sheets, this RSS code, that then tells you what you're getting and tells that program, that podcatcher program, to download it. And so the end result is very similar to what you might experience with a webcasting or streaming system. But it's actually quite different the way that it operates, and that's part of what makes the modern podcasting ecosystem so unique. It is wildly different from the way a lot of other technologies are evolving, and it's a lot more old school in a lot of ways. But it also has additional benefits that, say, streaming does not have in our modern technological ecosystem. The ability to download something for offline use, for instance, is not terribly common in a media landscape where people are trying desperately to maintain control of their media assets. Podcasting is definitely a technology that is on the upswing, though it's still nowhere near the scale of essentially any other popular type of entertainment or streaming-like technology. 
According to Pew Research, a a study that was released on podcasting this year, 21% of Americans that are 12 or older have listened to a podcast in the last month. So one out of five, that's that's not terrible, particularly for something that's still kind of a, a niche way to consume information. And it's up from 2013 when it was just 12%. It is a, it's not quite doubled since 2013. And so that's a pretty dramatic growth in just a couple of years. And it's even better when you look at people who have ever listened to a podcast, not necessarily in the last month, but ever in their entire lives. 36% say that they have. So over one third of the population has heard a podcast at some point. And that is up from 18% in 2008. And as I mentioned, a big part of this growth that's happening, a big part of why podcasts are flourishing despite being somewhat outdated technology compared to the other ways we have of accessing online media, is that it allows us to access these things even while not connected directly to the internet. We can listen to them while offline. And 64% of the people who say they have listened to a podcast at some point in their life they listen on a mobile device. And so I I have to assume that part of why the podcasting scene is so vibrant right now is that it has kind of a natural advantage in the portable device space that streaming technology is catching up with, definitely. There's a lot of different buffering and caching technologies that are allowing streaming to operate even when you're disconnected from the internet say, while you're in a subway or on a road trip. But there's still quite a gap there in terms of usability under certain circumstances. So things are looking pretty good. It is still quite a niche thing relative to TV or or Netflix and things like that. And even compared to other audio transmission, this is still a very niche way of listening. 54% of all audio listening still takes place on AM, FM radio. And so that, that is a number that includes things like Spotify, Apple Music, Google Play. There are a lot of players in the music and like talk radio scene these days. And over half of all of that still happens on traditional radio. And a lot of, frankly, the great work that is out there in terms of music, but also in terms of talk radio and news and and even things like like Let's Know Things, a lot of that is happening on traditional AM, FM radio. A lot of it is better in overall quality and content than even comparable podcasts because there's a lot more history and there's a lot more standards behind it. Podcasting is kind of a wild west right now, whereas radio is a little bit like traditional publishing in that there's a lot of great work being done by indie authors, but there's also a lot of kind of terrible stuff because you can produce and publish without having so many gatekeepers, whereas traditional radio has quite a few gatekeepers and podcasting. Just anybody can do it. And so there's pros and cons to both. You, you end up with a lot more people podcasting, but the percentage of quality there is much smaller whereas you might have fewer people doing traditional radio, but the percentage of that number that is high quality tends to be much higher, I would argue. But despite that, radio listening is slowly decreasing, whereas podcast listening is slowly increasing. And the reason behind this, I think, is that traditional radio, those who have not started their own podcast, at least within that space, is still a time-sensitive matter. You have to be listening to the radio at that particular time when the particular show is on. And just like with television, where people might like a particular show but miss it accidentally, you have to kind of reshape your entire lifestyle around being in front of a screen at a particular time if you want to take it in. It's simply not convenient. And we've come to expect something more than that now that we have this kind of always on demand economy that gives us what we want when we want it and where we want it, what device we want to use to take it in. And so the the latent advantage that podcasting has over a lot of other technologies, but particularly technologies like traditional radio, is that you can listen to it whenever the hell you want. You can download it and listen to it offline. 
You can listen to it in the middle of the night. You can listen to it in the morning. You can listen to it in the afternoon rather than having to tune in during your commute, for example. And if you don't listen to it then, then you've missed it unless they rebroadcast it at some point. This means, too, that podcasts are a lot more likely to be evergreen. That is, they're, they're always relevant and always listenable into the future. And so if you produce the type of content that is not terribly time-dependent, is not talking about a particular thing that's, that happened today, and that people a year from now will not know what you're talking about, then you have the potential to create something that is relevant for decades, whereas a lot of traditional radio tends to focus on things that are more of the minute, or if they do focus on evergreen content, they're doing it in such a way that you cannot listen to it again in the future, even if you want to. And this is something, as I mentioned, that really fits well with our changing habits because of the way that we consume media in general. We are much more likely to want things that are us-sized, things that fit us and fit our schedule. In some cases, very, very specific schedules that are specific to us and only us. And so being limited in this way to only be able to consume content at a certain time on a certain device, it doesn't match up with the use habits of an increasing percentage of the population. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the way that we consume information and how the user interfaces that we use to interact with this information is swiftly changing, and particularly swiftly changing in one specific direction. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. This is typically where I would mention the sponsors for the show, and I, I will do that at the end along with my typical book recommendation and such. But for this episode, I want to thank all of the people who have helped contribute to the show, both monetarily and non-monetarily thus far. This is the 20th episode that I've put out, and this is a show that's still not fully sustained. It's not something that I'm making uh, money off of at this point, but it is something that is getting easier and easier, particularly because people are contributing either a dollar per episode or setting up monthly payments to, to help support the show and my work as a whole. And a lot of people, too, are leaving reviews on iTunes or sharing it with their friends. All of these things help immensely, and I really, truly appreciate it. I get the biggest smile on my face. Every time I get a message from PayPal or from Stripe saying that somebody has contributed a dollar or three dollars or ten dollars or whatever makes sense to them, it really does make an immense difference. And I do hope at some point to be able to expand this show and to do a couple episodes per week and things of that nature. It's just a matter of making sure that all of the financials are in place as I do that. And so thank you guys very much for helping me eke closer and closer toward that next step. I should also mention that I've recently redesigned the, the contribute section of the letsknowthings.com front page. And so if you go there to letsknowthings.com and you scroll down a little bit, you will see a much better organized collection of information about how you can contribute. And there, there's a bunch of different options. There's the direct contribution, as I mentioned. You can set up a monthly automatic payment of whatever you like. You can share with your friends. You can even do your Amazon shopping through the link that I have there, and I will get a small, like, finder's fee, essentially, for sending you there, and it doesn't cost you anything extra. So there's a bunch of different ways that you can support the show, if you care to. Either way, thank you guys so much for listening. I am blown away by the fact that there are people out there who want to geek out on this stuff along with me. So thank you for that. All right, let's get back to the show. So this week's article that I want to start from and unspool is actually three different articles from three different technology websites. The first is from Wired, and the title is Hands-On, 
Apple's AirPod wireless earphones look crazy but work great. The second is from Recode, and the title is Amazon's Alexa Group is on a massive hiring spree. And the third is from Engadget, and the title is Hands-Free OK Google Commands Come to Google Maps. Now, the place that all three of these articles intersect, because they're all about different companies, they're about Apple, Amazon, and Google, but where they intersect is that they are all talking about the very quickly burgeoning field of hands-free input with our devices. To kind of set the scene for what we're going to talk about, let's, let's look at what exists now and what's happening right now. There was a recent uproar with the new iPhone, the iPhone 7, because Apple chose to remove the traditional headphone input, which essentially means that they're moving away from a much older but incredibly widely accepted standard just the little headphone jack that you find on everything, which works with every type of headphone in the world, they decided to do away with it. And in its place, they decided to ensure that their hardware and software works much better and much more intuitively, they think at least, with wireless options. And so that's, that's one dimension of this conversation, is that they are very intentionally creating a more robust wireless mesh, a web of connections that weaves throughout all of the devices that you have on you so that they're all talking to each other. Your phone is always talking to your watch, is always talking to your headphones. And by doing that wirelessly, they create kind of a standard for how fast these things connect and how well they connect. And they're also ensuring that they can make the devices smaller because something like a headphone input, a headphone jack, actually takes up a great deal of space compared to what you could do with non-analog technology, with like putting an additional microchip or putting an additional segment of battery in there, for instance. In terms of Amazon, what they've been doing is building the Amazon Echo. And the Echo is a cylindrical device that you put in your home, and it is always listening for your voice commands. And so you say, Alexa, do this. Alexa, buy me more paper towels. And it will buy those things for you on Amazon. And it'll ask you some clarifying questions, perhaps. But once you've connected it to your online life, and increasingly to your other gadgets throughout your home, you suddenly have this voice interface that allows you to do a whole lot more than you could have done before. And then Google, as Google is wont to do, is trying to get involved in everybody's space. They've got an upcoming event, which by the time you hear this will have been a weeks old event, but they have an event coming up where they are expected to release a new phone and they are also going to probably make an announcement about an Echo competitor that is meant to be an audio interface for all of your smart devices. So something that would compete with the Echo that would allow you to just say, hey, Google do this, or, or rather, okay, Google do this. This article that we're starting from here indicates that that voice command is already active on Android phones. It's already active with Google Maps. It allows you to just say out of nowhere to your phone, okay, Google, find the nearest gas station, and then it will go ahead and bring that up without you having to touch your phone at all. And where all of these articles interact then is that we're creating not just individual products. I mean, that's part of it, but the, the big picture here is that these are not just individual products that suddenly allow you to do cool things with voice activation. This is a growing set of standards around that type of input. This is a land grab to a certain degree to see who becomes the, essentially who creates the new Google search bar, because it's supposed that being able to just say what is the weather going to be like today to an empty room and getting an answer is going to be the, the killer app of, of our new technologies, not just one new technology. And so we have these three, and more than them, but these are the three big players, all of these heavy hitters trying to rush in and make sure that they are the ones that set that standard. 
Google was able to make their fortune because they rushed in and set the standard for search technology on the web. And that allowed them also to set the standard with advertising technology on the web. And so it is guessed that whoever is able to set this standard with audio input will be the person who is able to essentially do the same thing that Google did back in the day. They will be able to create that ecosystem and define what it looks like and very probably define it in such a way that they benefit above all the other players in that space. So part of the uproar about Apple leaving out the headphone jack is is kind of something that happens every time we change technologies. Every time something disappears from an Apple product, we kind of get into a tizzy until we, a couple years later, realize that it was actually a smart move and now none of us cares. Every once in a while it goes the opposite direction and people actually do care and we continue to care and continue to complain because it actually was a really bad move and the rest of the industry does not fall into line. There is a chance here, for instance, that Apple will remove the headphone jack from their device, nobody else follows suit, and then all of the headphone manufacturers essentially realize that it's not worth their while to change their entire industry and to change the way that their headphones connect and to create entirely new product categories, these wireless headphones, just for this one device. That would obviously be very bad for Apple to have taken this gamble and to have not changed the industry in a way that is beneficial to them, that gives them kind of the first mover benefits. But it's something that they're betting on. And uh, and I'm personally actually willing to bet that it will work because in so many different ways, it actually is a really smart move in terms of the way our hardware is evolving. We've had the technology to do this for a long while, but now today we have technology that allows us to do it really well. So I'm willing to bet that it will be a very short period of time between now when people are worried that it's not going to work and that it will be difficult to adjust to and reaching the point where wireless devices scattered throughout our body essentially on our wrist and in our ears and in our pocket will actually be an optimal way or a more optimal way for a lot of us to interact with those devices. And what that does is it kind of sets the hardware scene both Apple's move to, to create like a wireless mesh between these devices, but also what Google and Amazon are trying to do by making your home an interface-free or a visual interface-free environment where you can simply speak and say, what is the temperature going to be like today? Or do I have any new emails? And then have, it, have just a, a disembodied voice give you that information, read you your emails, read you the day's news play a certain song that you want to hear, they are gambling that this is going to be the next very popular type of input device. And when I talk about input device, an input device is like a keyboard. It's a mouse. The earliest computer input devices were punch cards and then punch tape, which were essentially pieces of paper and then pieces of tape that had holes in them. Those holes were read by computers. They were processed, they were turned into machine language, and then they they made the hardware or software do certain things. Today we have layers on top of that that allow us to use graphical interfaces and language interfaces that then is translated into that machine language that makes these devices do certain things. We have keyboards, we have mice. Interestingly, the precursor to the mouse was the trackball. And the trackball was invented in 1941. It was a part of a World War II era anti-aircraft radar system. Essentially what you had was a ball that was perched atop two rubber-coated wheels. And so when you moved the ball, it moved the wheels, and the movement of those wheels told the computer what you were intending to move around. And early mice used a similar kind of gyroscopic method of tracking. But eventually, the ball on the bottom of the modern iteration of the mouse was converted into kind of a laser tracking system. And I remember when this happened back in the 90s, how the the new mice were very cool. But like most new technologies, they were also quite sluggish and unreliable compared to the gyroscopic ball method that had been used for so long, or at least so long in terms of computing devices, not so long in absolute time. 
But none of that would have happened, I think, if Microsoft hadn't made their Word software mouse compatible back in the 80s. That's kind of what mainstreamed the mouse. Apple was doing some pretty cool stuff with it too, but they hadn't mainstreamed it, uh, whereas Microsoft's move did. And so that became kind of like the de facto input device. We had keyboards to type out words. And initially, we only had keyboards. We didn't have the mouse. And so you had to use words to tell the computer to do anything. But then we eventually got the mouse, which allowed us to move around and interact with a graphical interface. From there, we've kind of had just evolutions of those. We, we've had styluses, which have harkened us back to the era of pen and paper. But a lot of the more recent innovations around input have just been evolutions of the keyboard and mouse. We've had touchscreen keyboards, which we use on most of our smartphones these days. We've had touchpads that have replaced the mouse on a lot of laptops, for instance. And then the more recent iteration of the touchpad mouse has been the gesture command multi-touch mouse that allows you to do different things, to move your fingers in different ways and pinch to zoom and such on your mouse pad and then on your phone and any other touchscreen device. The next evolution of that has been the introduction of things like haptic feedback, which allows you to do something on your screen and to tap it and then get like a vibration response that makes it feel as if something physical has happened, as if you are interacting with a physical object when in fact you are simply interacting with a digital object. Now the evolution of that is leading us into some very interesting spaces like the, the virtual reality and augmented reality gestures that a lot of these new technologies are using. If you look at some very impressive devices like Microsoft's HoloLens and the Magic Leap technology, which we haven't seen as much from so far, but seems to use something similar, what you have is either an overlay over your real view of the real world or a virtual space that then tracks your hands and allows you to make gestures in three-dimensional space to control things or create things or make things happen. This is a, an evolution of being able to do gesture controls on your touchpad mouse, but it is hopefully something that will be a whole lot more intuitive because it's something that we do in real life. We move our hands around and do things and manipulate things in order to make things happen. We saw early versions of this with devices like the Kinect that was made for the Xbox. This was essentially a camera that had some very impressive software that allowed it to track the shape of a human body and see what you were doing. And a lot of the modern virtual reality, augmented reality devices use something similar to that where it tracks the shape of your hands or your individual digits to see what you want to do and then turns that into the, the code that is fed to the machine so that it knows what to do. We've already seen some versions of this, there's some very simplified versions of this that were nonetheless very impressive for the time in the Nintendo Wii controllers, the, the Wii Mote, as they were called. This is a kind of like TV remote shaped controller that was tracked in a couple of different ways. It was tracked using a sensor bar that you would put on or near your television that would track where the remote was in space and what the laser pointer end of it was pointed at. And then it also had gyroscopes inside. It had an accelerometer of the same type that you find in most modern smartphones that could track on, across three axes, track which direction the remote is being pivoted. And so this allowed for a whole lot more diversity in the types of input the machine was getting. And as a result, it quote unquote knew what you were doing with the device and what you intended to control on the screen. And so these interfaces, these different input devices, input methods that we have are really significant because they allow us to do such different things. The idea of having a smartphone that you can only interact with with a traditional mouse, for instance, or that you can only interact with using a, an old school clickety clackety keyboard it drastically reduces the utility of that device. The fact that you can tap on the screen or pinch to zoom on the screen, that you can touch a button and it, it makes various different things happen depending on how hard you push the button. These are kind of what allows the magic of that device to actually happen. 
the fact that you can interact in so many different ways and have a fine-grained degree of control over what you are doing with the device. The reason that these big companies, and a lot of smaller ones, but these big companies in particular, are getting invested in this is that they are betting that voice recognition is going to be that next killer input device. That voice recognition will be the next tap to zoom and the next multi-touch. It'll be the next thing that allows you to seamlessly and intuitively interact with your devices in a way that is beneficial for you, that is beneficial for them, and that creates a richer and less limited experience when you are interacting with their devices. And so what goes into this? Why have we not had voice recognition and voice user interface devices before this? And why are they such a big deal now? Part of the reason that this has not become popular and mainstream before is that it's just very, very difficult. It's very difficult to do it well. We have had voice recognition for a very long time. It has just been generally terrible. We've had a lot of these technologies that are, that are happening now and finally hitting the mainstream, but they have been used and, and frankly usable only by very edgy people, people who are on the edge of technology, because they were just incredibly difficult to use. And the only reason that you would use them is that you want to try out these new things before everybody else. You think it's cool, not useful. It's just, it's interesting. It's different. What has changed is that we have the immense power of cloud computing and being able to essentially stitch supercomputers together virtually across great distances. So that is huge. And that is important because voice recognition is kind of a brute force activity right now. Some things that we've learned to do with our computers, we've learned to do them and make them go mainstream because we've come up with a clever way to parse the information or a clever way to set up the computing power so that it's applied correctly. And as a result, we, we don't use substantially more power for that than for anything else. For voice recognition, it requires a just massive amount of computing power to make it work. And consequently, to have voice recognition occur on your phone, for instance, so that you can say something and your phone will hear it and then it will understand what you're saying. It can track the words that you're saying, regardless of your accent, regardless of your pronunciation, and figure out with like 99% reliability what you are saying, and then take that and understand the structure of the sentence and understand the information in it, and then do something based on that. These are all incredibly involved processes, and they require essentially supercomputing might to make occur. And to do them in like a second, the way that you want anything that happens on your phone to happen, like you wouldn't want to use voice recognition technology that takes 20 minutes after you say something to actually do something for you. And so to make that work, what is required is not just a substantially better processor in your phone, which is something that, you know, is always improving incrementally, but we've recently had a series of very important upgrades in that regard but also the ability to then tap into those cloud computing supercomputers, use their processing power, and then send the results to your phone in real time. And so typically what's happening when you use something like this, when you talk to your phone, when you talk to, to Google on your phone and tell it to search for the weather today, what it is very typically doing is processing some of that perhaps on your phone, if it's a common command, maybe that's already downloaded onto your software. But in most cases, what it's doing is taking that audio data, sending it to a supercomputer, having that parse the words that you're saying, and then try to figure out what you mean by that, and then get the information that you need, and then sending it back to you. All of these things happening along wireless internet, typically. And so we've also, in addition to just the raw computing power and getting smarter algorithms to, to manage it all, to, to run on these computers, we've also just needed faster wireless data. And this is why in a lot of the world, things like voice recognition and voice interfaces are not realistic yet. A lot of these things that we think our phones are doing or that we think our Amazon Echo is doing are in fact things that are operating elsewhere. They are running on these massive computers that are distributed throughout the world, 
we are just getting the result of them. These devices are calling elsewhere to do the hard work and then delivering the information to us. So we've got these confluence of different technological evolutions that have occurred that finally make this a realistic thing for more than just those fringy folks who, who like to try out all the new things that serve as kind of crash test dummies for the rest of us. Thank you so much to everybody who is like that for suffering through the horrible initial stages of all of these really cool technologies so that the rest of us can benefit, by the way. But the reason that something like this is going mainstream right now is that it is very significant in the way that we use our devices and the way that these technology companies hope that we will continue to use our devices in the future. As I mentioned for the intro, increasingly more of what we do, more of the ways that we interact with our technology are very different use cases from what you might expect and how you might expect somebody to use their computers, for example, 20 years ago. Today, we carry our computers in our pockets, largely. And the devices that an increasing number of us use most frequently are things like smartphones. We, we still use our laptops and tablets and, and TVs, but our smartphones are very quickly becoming the dominant devices in a lot of our lives. And that means that in terms of consumption and creation, but consumption in particular is very important for these types of companies, we do a lot more of our consuming from wherever, not just from a desk, not just from home. We do it while moving around, while doing other things. And so if they are going to keep us engaged, that means figuring out ways to continue to engage with us, to incentivize us to engage, rather than simply demanding that we be in a certain place at a certain time, like, like radio does, like standard cable television does. That's not something that fits within our lifestyles increasingly. And if we move forward another generation, it's very unlikely that most people will put up with the idea of having to be in a certain place at a certain time, on a certain device even, to consume content or to buy things. And so these technology companies are trying to get ahead of that curve. There are a lot of reasons to do this, but the consumption argument is a massive one. Whoever creates the most usable and the, the most connected, really, model for this and gets everybody else on board, like Apple is trying to do with their wireless headphones, they are going to be the people who determine how we use these technologies and resultantly how we tend to consume. The significance of this shift that will continue, no doubt, to utilize other input methods, by the way. We, we're not going to get rid of keyboards probably anytime soon. And I think touchpads and other mice of that type, including like digital keyboards on our phones, they'll definitely stick around for a long while. These are things that are still incredibly useful. But as we move more toward audio input, toward vocal input, a lot of things I think will change. And a lot of them for the better, but some of them not quite so good, particularly for some groups of people. So significantly, a lot of studies have shown that for people who get the hang of it, at least, and who use good versions of the software, voice input is almost always faster than typing. Right now, there is still a significant enough degree of error, particularly for people with strong accents or for people who do not enunciate very clearly. There's going to be a lot more errors. And for consumer grade software right now, it is still in my experience at least, maybe a 90% accuracy proposition, if you're lucky, if you have good software. But the stuff that they're using on a pro level and in the background of some of these other technologies, it's really, really good. And the transcription that these things can do are something like 99.7% accurate. And if they can get something like that out to more people faster and on multiple devices, I think most people, unless you type 200 words a minute, are going to find that it's much faster, almost always, to speak than to type. This type of input is also really wonderful if you are doing something else other than sitting in front of a screen with a keyboard. It is wonderful if you are driving, if you're out walking, if you are simply away from your desk but still motivated to be working. 
If you remember something that you need to do and you're at the grocery store and so you don't have anything with you other than this particular device, if used correctly, this could potentially be the type of input that allows you to always be working but never be working. And and that's a, a pro and a con, depending on how you look at it. But the idea that you can be productive if and when you need to and if and when it makes the most sense rather than needing to be in a particular place at a particular time, rather than needing to be in an office, rather than needing to be in front of certain types of hardware and software. That, that's a pretty compelling argument, I think, for a lot of people. And that's the way that a lot of creative fields in particular within uh, places like the United States, but also a lot of other cultures around the world, they're moving in that direction. A little bit more flexibility and mobility and interchangeability, I guess, within even these very large, cumbersome corporate environments. Rather than forcing people to be at a certain place at a certain time, just like with television or radio, moving away from that and allowing people to fit work into their life, if and where it makes sense, has been shown in a couple of different ways, not not in this way directly, but in a couple of different ways in a couple of different studies, to generally increase productivity and make each hour that you do work a whole lot more effective and efficient compared to just sitting in a chair at a desk for eight hours a day. It's also notable that a lot of these technologies that are are leading to this audio input revolution were initially developed for people who are sight impaired, blind people and people who are very nearsighted or shortsighted or have cataracts, who have some kind of visual impairment. They have become experts at using this type of thing for years and years and years now. They have all kinds of technologies that, although they're not given a whole lot of attention, they are incredibly impressive. And so the sighted community will owe a lot of thanks, I think, to the blind community and the otherwise sight-impaired community for helping to evolve this technology to the point that it's at. And as this becomes more mainstream, it will be very significant because they won't have to jump through so many hoops, I think, to have their specialized technology that helps them get around and helps them peruse media like the internet. It will interact well and plug in well to everything as opposed to being something that is often overlooked, no pun intended, right now. And as I mentioned, in a lot of ways, the audio input mechanism becomes a non-device specific search bar. And I think the search bar has become such a utility almost that we often overlook how much we use it and how baked into everything it has become. The idea that you can just type keywords or a name or a question. You can even search using a video or an image to reverse image search. The idea that you can just peruse everything on the internet, that you can peruse a significant chunk of human knowledge using keywords or a question, and the intelligent algorithms behind that will do its best to give you relevant information based on that. That is super cool. That is game changing. That is essentially what made the web go mainstream. And the idea that we'll be able to do the same thing, but to make it non device specific or non hardware specific, I guess. Because all you would need to do is be within the hearing range of a microphone and just ask a question into thin air and you will get an answer the same way. That is remarkable and it is potentially game changing. In a lot of different ways, it's potentially game changing. Now, Amazon's Echo is arguably the most successful of these devices thus far. It is also currently expanding offerings to build an audio kind of smart mesh in your home in the way that Apple is going wireless with its phone to try to create a smart mesh of assorted devices that you are carrying with you. Amazon is trying to do the same thing for your home so that your toaster is connected to your refrigerator, is connected to your thermostat, is connected to your Bluetooth speaker, and all of these things are unified, are connected to the audio interface built into your Amazon Echo. And so you can talk to your Echo and say, hey, turn the temperature up to 77. Or, hey, turn down the temperature in the refrigerator. Or maybe play this particular type of music and play it through my Bluetooth speaker. Or why don't you adjust the lights? 
Things like that you can suddenly do. Because all of these devices, although maybe they are quote-unquote smart devices in that they can connect to the internet, not all of them have very good interfaces. You have to control them with a particular app, for instance, on your phone. And so, like, your one light bulb has an app that you have to open if you want to adjust that light bulb. Connecting all of these things to one unit and to one set of instructions is the, the kind of killer app behind something like the Amazon Echo. And what they've done is they've released uh, an API. It's essentially a set of instructions and commands that then people can build their own software on top of it using Amazon's system that they've built, the, the voice instruction system, so that then if the manufacturer of your smart light bulb wants to connect to Amazon's ecosystem that they are building, they just take that API, build their own commands on top of it, and then that means that you can tell your Echo, hey, turn up the lights, and it can do that because those devices are now connected. On the consumer end, things like this tend to be incredibly seamless. And Amazon making that move to put out that API so quickly is a very good indication that that is something that they want to control, the smart home space. This, again, is not a new technology. I mean, Sonos has had high-end voice-activated speakers and systems for a long while. And there have even been like pricey lighting systems and smart TVs built into luxury homes, the, the type of high-end designer home that you find perch on Los Angeles cliff sides. These things have been around for ages, but they're all kind of really crappy versions of what we have in just regular mid-range priced consumer gadgets today. The thing that our gadgets are missing is what those smart homes had, where everything's tied together into a central unit that you can control. And that is what Amazon is trying to do. It's trying to tether all of these things together so that they become a unified whole. They even released a new device recently called the Dot, and it's essentially like a, a smaller, a much shorter version of the Echo, and it's also much cheaper. And the idea is that you have your Echo maybe sitting in the kitchen, and then you have one of these Dot devices in each room, and they all connect back to the Echo. And so the end result is that you essentially have that smart home feel without having to have your home built with this technology into it from the get-go, built into the walls, and therefore hard to replace. This is a relatively inexpensive device that makes any home into a smart home that is completely voice-activated. Now, the downside of this type of system, and there is, there's actually many, one of the downsides is that those of us who are accustomed to older methods of input, those of us who grew up typing on keyboards and using computer mice, we are at as much of a disadvantage as anybody who is encountering a new type of input device. People back in the day who were perfectly happy using DOS, so they were inputting commands into their computers using completely text-based commands using just the keyboard. When the mouse came out and the graphical interface came out, some of them were like, okay, screw this, this is ridiculous, I don't need this, it worked just fine before, why do I have to learn how to use this stupid new device? And some of them eventually came around, and some of them no doubt did not. They still kind of resent that, that stupid computer mouse that ruined everything. The same is true with thumb typing on smartphones. I type very, very fast on a traditional computer keyboard because that's what I grew up with. And I use the mouse really well too. Using a smartphone keyboard, learning to type with my thumbs, that took a little bit of time. And I am still significantly slower with it than I am with a traditional keyboard. And so there are growing pains with anything like this where we are suddenly forced to learn a completely new set of skills without being guaranteed that we'll be able to use them in the long term. There are a lot of different devices. The stylus, for example, is a great example of this, where we are told that this input method is the best possible input method, and so we all need to learn how to use it, when in reality, the evolution of touchscreen technology made it kind of silly to learn to use a stylus on touchscreens. Our, our fingers and thumbs made a whole lot more sense for the way that technology evolved. And so there's absolutely always the chance, too, that something like an audio input device will be like the stylus, where it is something that seems to make perfect sense as a next step. And a lot of people will invest a lot of time and energy and resources 
to develop and to learn how to use. And then it could falter, it could fail. For any number of reasons, it could not be the next step. It could be something that is just wasted time to be involved with to begin with. And so there's, there's no way to know how this type of thing will shake out, and so that's a potential risk. But it's also just an immediate downside, even if it does succeed, because we all have to learn this new skill. It's also worth noting that the hearing impaired will have a lot of trouble with this type of technology. People who get the majority of their information about the world and from other people visually will be largely left out of a lot of the benefits of this potential revolution. Their communication method of choice may degrade in quality and in terms of use as a result of something else like this popping up. It's worth noting, too, that it's not just the people who have trouble hearing or who, who cannot hear who might be left out of aspects of this. I have a Bluetooth speaker that I can connect wirelessly to my computer or to my phone. And when I turn it on or turn it off or connect a Bluetooth device or decouple a Bluetooth device from it, it makes different pitches, makes different sounds to indicate what is happening. This is an incredibly simple example of the types of data that will be contained within sounds, the type of context that we can glean from sounds. If you look at a website and you see that the links within the text are very typically a different color from the rest of the text, that is information that if you are seeing impaired in some way, if you're colorblind, for example, you could miss out on that context and as a result, not have all the same data that everybody else has. And so there's a version of that with hearing. If you have trouble distinguishing between tones, if you are tone deaf in a very literal sense, then you will also miss out on a great deal of the context that is happening in the audio environment around you. And so this is something that, just like with colorblindness, we'll have to take into consideration because we don't want there to be meaning being communicated using these different inputs and delivery systems that is completely going over the head of some people through no fault of their own. In addition to those kinds of personal level concerns, there are a lot of concerns about the, the devices and what they mean for society as a whole as well. A lot of the devices, and particularly the ones that work best, the ones that are most popular and most versatile, need to be listening, maybe quote-unquote listening, at all times in order to function. When you have an app like Siri, for example, on your phone, or if you have an Amazon Echo, to activate it, you say, Alexa, do this. These devices need to be turned on all the time, and the microphone needs to be active at all times, listening for you to say those keywords. And so these are things that do not just activate when you call on them. They, they start to do more things when you call on them. But the listening hardware and software needs to be activated at all times in order to function optimally. Otherwise, you would have to tap something or you know, activate an app to make it work, and that would eliminate some of the point of having the completely voice-activated system. And so when something like this is listening at all times, and we live in a a post-Edward Snowden revelations world where we know that there's a lot of entities that are listening to us, that are wanting information about us, and that may not use that information benevolently. And so the idea that we would have these devices, not just in our homes, but on us at all times, that are listening at all times to everything that we say and do, that is a little bit disconcerting, I think. And for some people more than others, to some people, this doesn't seem like such a threat. There's that I have nothing to worry about because I have nothing to hide argument against the idea of privacy. But a lot of our social values, a lot of our structures are dependent on the idea that we can have our own private thoughts and spaces. So whether or not you're doing something illegal, the idea that somebody could take your information, could take a conversation that you had in private and misuse it in some way against you, or even just be aware of it, might change the way that you act in private. And that's what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to avoid having to be performing 24-7 as a result of this type of 
unintentional surveillance. And so that, that is a major concern that a lot of people, I think, very rightly have. I haven't seen any good fail-safes or solutions for this yet, because again, for these audio-based interfaces to work correctly, they kind of do have to be listening all the time. And even though they are not, supposedly at least, and I, and I tend to believe it, they are not taking the things that you say and sending them anywhere when you haven't activated them by using those keywords, I think that there's going to be a lot of cases, and perhaps even now, where some of that information makes it out, and some of that information is processed just in case or to help improve the algorithm that's listening and to try to make it better at listening to people with different accents and people who are not hardcore enunciators. And so with the best intentions, they could create a system where they are taking this information, and it might actually eventually end up in the hands of people who would misuse it, even if these companies in particular are not intending to. So that, that is a very important concern. Now moving from the hardcore serious into something maybe a little less serious, but potentially serious just in a different way, is that if you remember the release and the hubbub around Google's wearable device, Google Glass, which was a set of glasses that had an overlay on them so that you could look up and get information without having to pull out a particular device. It was always there within your line of sight if you looked up to see it. And it had a camera built into it as well. This device was considered to be cool and interesting and innovative in a certain geeky sort of way. But it was also considered to be like the bad type of geeky in the sense that it looked ridiculous and most people thought it looked ugly, and that it also seemed a little bit tone deaf in the way that cool, geeky things can kind of be sometimes. And, and what I mean by tone deaf in that regard is that it's a very interesting technology and something that I personally think needs to happen in some way if we're going to convert the internet from something that we go to, we leave real life to access and turn it into something that overlays real life so that we have information when we need it to make better decisions and to be safer and more fulfilled as we interact in real life. The way that it was presented directly conflicted with social norms. And so it became something that rather than adding an additional layer to real life, it actually became a wall between you and real life. Because nobody wanted to be recorded 24-7 and feel like they were being recorded when you were looking at them. Nobody knew what information you had that they didn't. And it also stood out as something that was wildly different. So people could automatically tell by looking at you that you were somebody who might catch them doing something stupid or might be reading information about them and they don't know it. A lot of these concerns were not warranted because the, the people who were using them tended to be, again, that, that kind of fringy, edgy type of person who just thinks it's cool technology. But because it intersected so catastrophically with social standards and norms, it became a really destructive means of achieving that kind of information and having that kind of technology in your life. And as a result, they, they discontinued the product. I'm sure they're still evolving it in some way, shape, or form, but they're going to need to do better because the way that they presented it and the way it looked, the way it operated within society, ended up not being cool and innovative for most people. It ended up being creepy. The same can be true with audio input devices, particularly at first, where I personally have, have been around people who've used audio input devices in public or in a confined space. And it's really weird and awkward for everybody else, even if it's something that might be incredibly useful in that moment. It's still something that feels a little bit like listening in on a private conversation. And it's almost the same as somebody whipping out a phone and having a really loud phone conversation in a crowded elevator. It feels like it's bumping against social norms, if not outright intersecting with them. And so that's something that's going to have to be worked on and potentially alleviated if this is going to become as common as they hope it will. It's very, very easy to interact with a smartphone, for instance, by tapping on the screen. It's something that's very private. Nobody else has to hear you tapping on that screen. 
Whereas interacting with it even by mumbling is something that everybody around you is disturbed by, potentially. It's worth noting that even if the, the audio input revolution occurs, as a lot of these companies seem to think that it will, it's not going to be something that replaces everything else, at least not at first, uh, and probably not ever. We are continuing to see research and development and products that are coming out with inputs that range from those 3D virtual reality, augmented reality, hand tracking systems that allow you to make gestures into space, almost like you're casting a spell to make things happen within that virtual world you're interacting with. Ranging from that to the haptic feedback that we have on our phones, where it tries to make the relationships that we have with these virtual, these digital, these pixelated things seem more real by interacting with us in terms of things that we can feel tactily. Those are going to continue to be very important for the foreseeable future, I believe. And most likely, what we're going to see, rather than a complete switchover to completely audio interfaces, is a situation where more of the interactions that we have with technology are simply more intuitive, natural, and less invasive. The, the benefit of many of these inputs is that we're, we're kind of opening up computing to a larger audience, which in turn means that we're opening up knowledge and communication and a larger library of powerful tools to the world. When the, the aforementioned Nintendo Wii was released, and the iPhone around the same time, the first iPhone, they were revolutionary for the same reason. The idea that you could play games or interact with a computing device without the traditional barrier of having to learn an input system like a keyboard or a mouse or a game controller opened up these platforms to massive new audiences. The uptick in the number of women and adults and young children who were suddenly using these devices, it, it was revolutionary in that it opened up gaming and certain elements of computing to the entire world, essentially, to the point where even a, a toddler can learn to use a lot of these things because it's so intuitive. Whereas before, these were spaces that were dominated by primarily young men of a certain age for whom the video game controller was more or less like an extra appendage. It was part of young man culture to understand how to use these things. It wasn't that these other groups of people didn't want to play. It's just that it required a very different type of thinking and a bit of work to learn to use those complex input devices. The same way that learning to code on a computer requires a very specific type of knowledge. And if you're willing to put in the effort, a lot of people can learn, but a lot of people are turned off by it because it's not something that is necessarily immediately helpful or beneficial to them and is something that requires a decent amount of time to, to pick up enough to be useful. Whereas, as we're seeing with a lot of new software that allows people to essentially get the results of having coded an app or a website, but by using just drag and drop technology instead, more people are building their own websites, more people are building their own apps, because that wall has been removed, that barrier to access has been lowered. And now more people can participate, and the world benefits, I would argue, because we get more voices and more input from a lot of different spheres that before we didn't hear from in those spaces. Ultimately, these types of evolutions, making the, the inputs more accessible and intuitive, and ensuring that they reach us wherever we are, even when we're not sitting in front of a desk, may be what allows us to tuck technology away completely and make it largely out of sight so that we're not fixated so much on the devices, but rather the information and the value that they add to our environments. It may be what allows us to go completely device-free at some point, because our inputs will be any surface that we might look at or any space we happen to be in. We have access to all the same stuff that we would have access to today, sitting in front of a computer or holding a smartphone, but we have it without having to interact with any specific device. These devices are all just built into the environment. Hands-free is just a sales pitch right now, but someday soon, 
it and its descendant technologies may free us from our current technological tethers and allow us to more freely graze on information and more casually create without ever touching a keyboard or even ever looking at a screen. As I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, a big part of why I am able to do what I do here with this project and with other projects is support from people like you. And so I very much appreciate all the support I've gotten already. Everybody who has contributed directly or purchased one of my books, thank you so very much. Everybody who has left a review for the show on iTunes or shared it with their friends, thank you very, very much. I do still think it would be cool to go entirely ad-free on this show at some point, uh, if and when I'm able to do that, and still make it financially sustainable. Nowhere near that right now, but the direct contributions from people really does help cover the costs, and that is a big part of why I'm able to do this as frequently as I do now, once a week. Now, I do have ambitions to eventually open it up and do two episodes a week. That is something I'm going to have to wait a little bit longer because I, I want to make sure that I can justify that in terms of the time spent and the amount of revenue brought in. But I'm currently talking to an ad network and, and open to other advertising potential opportunities as well. It's, it's a little bit trickier for me than for with some people because I'm very careful about the companies that I work with and I want to make sure that I'm not diluting the relationship that I have with you guys by putting the wrong ads on here. So it's a slow but steady process. Hopefully there will be some updates on that soon. But in the meantime, as always, checking out the sponsors, the advertisers helps a whole lot because that shows them that you guys are hearing this and interacting with it. And then in some cases they are affiliate relationships so that if you sign up for a free trial, or if you use them to get your hosting or something, for instance, then I, I get a cut of that, which is part of how I am funding the show right now. If you have a company or a service that you think would be a good fit, do reach out and let me know. And I also am going to try something. If you have an article, a news item of some kind that you would like me to base an episode on, or you think would make a good episode, send me an email, send it to Colin at exilelifestyle.com, or you can just go to the letsknowthings.com website and click on the contact page to get that information written down. But if you do have something you think would be interesting, let me know. Think at least some of the episodes each month that I do. If I get some good stuff coming in, I will do listener recommended articles because I think that would be an interesting way to mix things up. So send those to Colin at ExileLifestyle.com or just go to the contact page on the Let's Know Things website to send those my way. So speaking of sponsors, this episode was brought to you by HostGator. HostGator is the hosting company I have been gladly using for years. I cannot say enough good things about them. I once worked with like a handful of different hosting companies for different services and then eventually moved everything over to HostGator because they were just so much better. So if you are looking to start a blog or a portfolio site or a site for your business, they are worth checking out. They're worth checking out under normal circumstances, but they are also giving Let's Know Things listeners a substantial discount, something like 30 to 50%, I think, off of their offerings if you go to hostgator.com LKT. Again, that's also a great way to support the show, but selfishly as well, it's a great way to save some money and get excellent hosting services. This episode is also brought to you by Audible. Audible has an amazing app for listening to audiobooks. They also have the largest audiobook collection in the world. You can sign up for a free trial of Audible if you go to audibletrial.com LKT. You'll get a free month trial, a free audiobook of your choice. I've got a bunch of my books up there as audiobooks on Audible, but you can snag anything that you'd like out of their library. And if you don't have anything in mind, might I suggest the new nonfiction book, All the Single Ladies by Rebecca Traister. I read this quite recently. Incredible book. Very informative. I learned a whole lot, particularly about the earlier eras of the feminism movement. But it also does a really great job of covering the many 
the multitude of different movements that are happening right now within female culture, within marriage culture, and specifically within single culture for women in the United States right now. It is utterly fascinating the, the number of different elements, the number of different variables that have resulted in such a dramatic shift to the point where the majority of women of a certain age who at one point would have been mostly married, and if not, they would have been kind of socially ostracized for it, are now single. And in some cases, maybe unhappily or waiting to someday be married, but the circumstances are not perfect. And in other cases, doing it because culturally, it makes a whole lot more sense right now. And the way the economy and, and numerous other things work, it also makes a whole lot more sense. And so the stories that are told and the information that's given really shows how all those things tie together in a really interesting way. So I highly recommend the book, All the Single Ladies by Rebecca Traister, a great book to check out, whether you're getting it at the library or a local indie bookstore or on your Kindle or your Kobo, but it's also something that you can get on Audible and you can get it for free if you use that link that I provided, audibletrial.com slash LKT. If you'd like to see a complete list of options for ways to contribute to the show and help support it, you can go to letsnothings.com and scroll down a little bit. There's a full list of things there that I've recently reorganized to make them a little bit more easy to understand. Also at letsnothings.com, you will find the show notes for this episode and for every episode. You can find Let's Know Things on Facebook and on Instagram at Let's Know Things. You can find me personally everywhere on the internet, uh, Instagram to Snapchat to Twitter to everything else at Colin is my name. There is a Let's Know Things newsletter that comes out each Monday and contains a selection of links to interesting things. You can sign up for that for free at letsknowthings.com. The complete list of books that I have written are available at colin.io. That's a, another good way to support the show if you're enjoying it. Purchase one of my books. That certainly helps. And then two other projects that I have that you might be interested in are exilelifestyle.com, which is my blog where I write about all manner of things, and Consider This, which is a YouTube show that you can find very easily at YouTube or by searching for my channel there at Colin is my name. Thank you all so very much for listening. I am Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week. Mm -hmm.